All right, we are going to be talking about the last part of cellular respiration right now. Um, we've talked about glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, produces two total a two four total ATP, two net, two NADH as well, and the NADH will go to the electron transport chain. We talked about the pre-TCA reactions that occur in the mitochondrial matrix, where we create two total NADH, or one per acetyl-CoA that's made. Um, we lose two carbon dioxides here. Um, and pyruvic acid, or pyruvate, is the reactant to the pre-TCA re pre reactions, whereby we create two acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA is going to go into the Krebs cycle. All right. Remember that all of this is driven by the presence of oxygen. If oxygen is not present, all right, Remember, if oxygen is not present, we will be going to um, fermentation. All right. So we have our glucose. We glycolysis occurs, produces two net ATP and two um, NADH. And NADH will be transported into the mitochondria. Pyruvate then, um, through the pre-TCA reactions, pyruvate will then produce two more NADH as it gets converted to acetyl-CoA, and this is all occurring in the mitochondria, remember? The acetyl-CoA um, will then go into the TCA cycle, remember, acetyl-CoA goes in. All this stuff happens, goes around, and occurs in the mitochondrial membrane, but the most important part is that the TCA cycle is designed to produce electron carriers, which will end up going to the electron transport chain. So we produce three of them per cycle and two total. Um, as a result of having two acetyl-CoA's. So we also produce two ATP. So that's occurring in the mitochondrial membrane, or the mitochondrial matrix. Um, and you're probably wondering, where the heck, where on earth, where in the cell are these NADHs going? I mean, we're producing so many of them. But don't forget, remember that we're really, what we're really talking about with the TCA cycle is that it's, um, or cellular respiration in general, is it's all about electrons, remember? It's all about electrons, and don't ever forget that. And electrons are getting moved from one place or another via these reactions called, I know you were thinking redox reactions. So we're, it's all about harnessing electrons. It's all about redox reactions, all right, which brings us to the last part the electron transport chain all right now the electron transport chain is also called oxidative phosphorylation because it phosphorylates puts phosphate on atp or adp to make atp using oxygen oxidative so it's a phosphorylation process where we put phosphates on things using oxygen or in the presence of oxygen remember all right so We've gone through glycolysis, pre-TCA, and TCA, and now we're heading to this awesome place called the electron transport chain. All right, And don't forget, the electron transport chain is occurring on this inner membrane here. All right, The electron transport chain occurs on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. All right, So as we're going through this, you need to understand this membrane right here is the inner mitochondrial membrane. The outer mitochondrial membrane is somewhere out here, all right? And the space in between the inner and outer membrane is called the inner membrane space, all right? I also call it the IMS. So before anything, you need to understand where it occurs. This is the inner membrane. This space here is the inner membrane space, all right? This inner membrane space here, this gray in between the two black lines. Then you have the outer mitochondrial membrane and then you have the cytosol on the outside. So important places to know, cytosol, outer membrane, inner membrane, inner membrane space, and inside the mitochondria is called the mitochondrial matrix. All right, let's back up here. It's a lot of stuff. All right, now, remember here, the electron transport chain is designed to transport electrons while using redox reactions to allow electrons to jump from one place to another and as they fall, so we're allowing electrons through redox reactions to jump from one place to another as they fall in energy state. 
As they fall in energy state, we're going to be harnessing energy at each step of the way. All right? So we're going to be harnessing electrons as they fall, and electrons as they fall are going to need to be grabbed on by things with higher electronegativity. We're ultimately going to have oxygen at the end. Remember, fluorine isn't really used on a biological level because it's too electronegative. It's never going to let go of things. It's never going to let go of oxygen, or it's never going to let go of electrons. So oxygen is more abundant, it's more common. It's also not so super electronegative that uh, it, it will never let go of its electrons. All right, so we have the electrons. Sorry about all this jumping. All right, remember the electrons are coming from this molecule, the electron carrier, NADH. Remember, this carrier carries two electrons. All right, now, if you remember, NADH carries two electrons and one hydrogen. Remember, that leaves one hydrogen, all right, extra, and as these electrons jump off of the molecule, that other hydrogen that we were talking about, remember, NAD plus carries a positive charge down here and a hydrogen, but NADH, all right, carries two electrons and one hydrogen, but also puts one hydrogen in solution. So as these electrons jump off the molecule, what also lets go is this hydrogen, but it doesn't have its electron. All right. So what we've done now is we harness the electrons themselves, and we're leaving hydrogen ions in the mitochondrial matrix. All right. So the electrons are jumping onto this protein, and how are they jumping? Redox reactions. And as the electrons are moving through these proteins, the proteins themselves not only act as electron transporters, but they're also acting as active transport proteins. They're actively going to be forcing hydrogens across. And if you remember, where, does, where are the hydrogen ions more concentrated here? Well, if you look, the hydrogen ions are more concentrated up here. So if we were to allow them to diffuse on their own, where would they diffuse? Well, they would diffuse down into the matrix, remember? Diffusion principles tell us that things are going to diffuse from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Now, but we're using the energy of these electrons to force hydrogen ions across the membrane into the intermembrane space, creating what we call an electron gradient. Again, as these electrons jump from one place to another, all right, they're falling in energy state, they're getting attracted by things with higher electronegativity. And as the electrons are moving through the protein, the protein takes hydrogens and forces them across the membrane, all right, creating that hydrogen ion gradient. All right. Again, the electrons keep jumping and jumping and losing energy. Their energy is being lost because the energy that they had is being used to do work. The work is taking hydrogens and throwing them across the membrane again. Okay. Now, ultimately, we're going to reach a state at which our electrons have no more energy. All right, they're down here. All right, and we're going to need something with a high electronegativity to grab them because they have no energy left. We need to grab them from something with a lower electronegativity. All right. So what's waiting there? Oxygen. Oxygen is waiting there. Remember, we breathe in oxygen. The reason why we breathe oxygen in is so that it can grab on to these spent electrons. They have no more energy. They're not going to be able to throw any more hydrogens across the membrane. So oxygen then reunites with hydrogen ions to create the water molecule. So remember what we said before is that glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide, which we've released in the TCA and the pre-TCA reactions, and we've created water plus energy. And the energy we're going to get to in a second. So cellular respiration is a process that needs oxygen. If oxygen is not present, then electrons will not jump here, and everything will back up. If NADH backs up here, it's going to back up at the TCA. If NADH backs up the TCA, then acetyl-CoA won't go into the TCA. 
if acetyl-CoA doesn't go into the TCA, then pyruvate backs up. If pyruvate backs up, no acetyl-CoA is going to be made, so then we're going to have to reroute this process to a process called fermentation. All right. So remember what we said about oxygen being present or not. The reason why oxygen's presence is important is because it is ultimately going to be accepting these electrons with hydrogen ions to create the water molecule again. All right. Without oxygen, none of this process occurs. Okay. Remember, so we've used the electrons now that we've harnessed from glucose or from hydrogen in some form or another, and we're using those electrons to pump hydrogens across the membrane through active transport so that we create a hydrogen ion gradient in the mitochondrial, inner, inner mitochondrial space, inner membrane space. Now we've created a hydrogen ion gradient. There's another protein over here called ATP synthase, all right? Um, ATP synthase. Now what ATP synthase does is, let's look at a better picture here. Video maybe? All right, ATP synthase. I want you to look up ATP synthase videos. Um, but basically what ATP synthase is, is a very complex protein, all right, that basically allows hydrogen ions to flow through. And as these hydrogen ions flow through, this thing spins like a rotor. And as it spins like a rotor, it makes ATP, all right? So let's go back here to the PowerPoint. Remember, we've created a hydrogen ion gradient up here. All right, we've created a hydrogen ion gradient up here through the electrons. All right, we've now, now we're going to allow hydrogens to move through this protein. Now what process is this? What process is hydrogen ions moving through the membrane via a protein into a place where they're less concentrated? If you said facilitated diffusion, then you'd be correct, all right? So through facilitated diffusion, hydrogen ions are going to flow naturally back through the only place we're going to let them, okay? And as they do that, this protein is designed to spin and take another phosphate and put it onto ADP to make ATP, all right? Now, glycolysis produces two net ATP. The TCA cycle produces two total ATP, all right? But the electron transport chain produces about 34 ATP, all right? So overall, we've produced a net of about 38 ATP total per glucose molecule, with most of that energy being made by the hydrogen ion gradient through this protein called ATP synthase. Synth means to make, ACE is an enzyme, this is, an this is an enzyme, is a protein, it is a transporter, it is many things. It's one of the most important proteins in all of cells. It is responsible for taking ADP plus phosphate and making it into ATP. So now we've taken all of this chemical and en electron energy from the glucose molecule and we've converted that electron hydrogen, this electron energy into a hydrogen ion energy gradient and we've created this gradient, this, this hydrogen ion gradient between the membranes into a force, like water flowing through a dam, a force that spins the protein and allows this thing to make ATP. So now we've harnessed all of that chemical energy into a chemical form that can be used in so many ways.